Good evening, everybody, and thank you to the Norwegian Chamber for organizing this wonderful event and the sponsors we will recognize shortly, and also the 17th Software for this very elaborate office and wonderful reading area. I'd like to uh, welcome, first of all, uh, the Vice President of the Thai Norwegian Chamber of Commerce, Ms. B. Becke, who's going to welcome us all here. Please. Oh, you have the microphone already. So, welcome everybody. It's uh, amazing to see so many people on our very first event after COVID. Or, we're still in COVID time, but this is uh, our first event. Uh, we had expected uh, some 30, 40 people to show up, and on the list it says 72 that signed up, so this is exciting. Um, when we decided to have this event, it's because um, those that work with Europe, they of course know about the GDPR and the regulations that are involved with that. For the Thai members who are not working with Europe and that now are listening to the PDPA, you know, it's kind of difficult to remember all these uh, acronyms that we have, but for the PDPA, we will face challenges. And I would say especially for the SME, they will face challenges. So in today's event, what we are trying to do, we are trying to not make it too serious, not too technical, but we would like to make it an event where we put a few feelers out and we say, did you know? Are you prepared? Have you done so and so? Now, it should be a uh, panel discussion first. We have uh, people from Norway here, speakers from Norway, from uh, Singapore slash Australia. We have uh, legal firms here, so it will be a very interesting session. But please, afterwards, ask questions, because that's going to be very important. Thai uh, Region Chamber of Commerce is a small chamber, but we are part of a uh, group that's called Joint Foreign Chamber of Commerce in Thailand, which has 34 chambers and members. We may be small, but I think we have a big footprint and we have a strong voice. And I think working together as small chambers, which we do today, there's a lot of the smaller ones here, but also some of the bigger ones, we can make, a, we can have a voice and we can make a difference. There's a few companies that I would like to say thank you to, because without them, we would not be where we are today. It's our premium members and sponsors, Jolt and Silent, Norwegian Seafood Council, Yara, Abel, Seven Peak Software, our host today. I'm going to stop now and ask for a big applause for Seven Peaks. <laughs> Without these members, we would not be able to function as a chamber, and particularly during these challenging times of COVID. So thank you to them, and also thank you to all of you coming, for coming here today. I'm going to pass the mic back to Bob Fox. He is the chairman of the um, Educate, no, not the Education. Oh, from <laughs> the ICT, Digital Economy and ICT of Joy for a Chamber of Commerce. And he has in-depth knowledge on uh, this subject. So, Bob, please. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes, good. Thank you very much, Vivek. We have a big agenda today, and we're going to learn about the world of the personal data protection regime in Thailand. Thanks. The personal data protection regime in Thailand, uh, which has been informed a lot by the European uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which came into force in May 2018. So, we'll be looking forward to our own data protection regime here in Thailand. It's been a long time coming. We're going to see in a minute a bit of a timeline before we get into this. Let me just do a bit of housekeeping. Um, the the PDPA is essentially about data protection, not about privacy as such. So when we talk about protection, then security becomes a very important point. So we're going to learn about what it actually means, and especially for SMEs. We know, and we're going to see 
some of the problems associated with the current situation. We know that the full set of subsidiary rules, or generally called regulations, are not ready yet. Uh, our speakers are going to share what are relevant key learning points from four years of GDPR experience and how the PDPA here in Thailand will be, um, will be applicable. During the session, you can ask questions through the Pigeon Hall app, and there should be a little handout per table that shows you how to do the Pigeon Hall app. Um, it's not a login, it's a very simple, uh, something that appears on your screen, so please use your own devices. Uh, you'll have to use your own 4G or 5G network, um, rather than the Wi-Fi here. So, <clears throat> you can pose the questions at any time. So while they're fresh in your mind, please pose them. If you see a question that you like, you can upload it. But we will deal with those questions later, not exactly at the time you ask them. I just go through the uh, agenda briefly. Yes, no, the agenda. So the agenda is going to be uh, the speaking presentations, two from Tilby and Gibbons, and then here, uh, and then commentary from DTAC, and then we're going to have a, uh, a discussion about use cases. So the idea of this is we're focusing on a number of use cases which we believe should be helpful and relevant to you. And we'll try to focus around that. OK. Um, next, I'm just going to quickly show what happened with the data protection timeline. So go back to 2015. I remember spending many, uh, many Saturday mornings going to the ECHA offices and looking at concepts around data protection that was going to apply in Thailand. That was 2015. All of that sat there for a while until early 2018, when a new and energetic permanent secretary in the Ministry of Digital Economy and Society uh, picked it up with a new draft. And during 2018, we uh, developed this law in a draft form. By September, the draft had pretty well aligned itself with GDPR in a major change in the drafting stage. And then uh, May 2019, it was gazetted to be fully enforced a year later. It's been deferred twice. And the way it's been deferred is by reference to 19 business fields. But government side of it kept operating so that they could get ready is the idea. So it was only the downstream side, as we say, that was deferred. Uh, and then last year, 2021, we had three rounds of public consultation. We're going to see later what that was all about at conceptual level. Early 2022, formulation, formation rather, of the Personal Data Protection Committee. We'll see in a slide later what that means. And a possible deferral of the application from 1 June 2022 for some time. Possible deferral, not confirmed, applicable to small companies. Without further ado, I'd like to call on uh, Kun Novarat, followed by Kun Gavin from Tilki and Gibbons. Thank you. So thank you, Kun Bob, and good talk. evening, everyone. So it's a pleasure to meet you all here in person. So my name is Novarat. You can call me Paul. I'm here with my colleagues at Kunkilin, doing corporate chairs. Uh, we are from Delikin Equipments, a law firm based in Thailand, and we have a large office in around Southeast Asia. And today we will uh, focus on the PDPA overview of the PDPA, which including uh, the application of the PDPA, the exemptions and the key definitions under the laws and also the key requirements that require, especially for the data controller to comply with. So for the first slide, so for the first slide, um, as you may know, the PDPA is a primary law governing data privacy in Thailand. And it's already in that since 2019, and because of the COVID situation in Thailand, the law keep differs, right? As we have said twice. And maybe the referral? Maybe. But uh, according to the royal decree, the full, the, the, the full enforcement is the first of June this year, as you may know. So um, every 
organization in Thailand will be required to comply with the law, especially on the parts of the data controller and data processor obligations, which I will be um, further discussed in the next slides. And uh, there may be a benefit for those who consider small business. The small business may be um, granted for a first period, but not but not be required to comply with the PDP requirements. But this is just a news not confirmed yet by the authorities. However, if in fact you are exempt by not complying with the law, but we still strongly recommend you to comply um, with the security standard because you as a company still have a risk under the thought law. And why? Why you need to? Uh, why we need the law, the privacy law? Because we need to strengthen and unify personal data protections aligned with the global privacy standards like GDPR. And where is the law enforced? Yes, it's obviously that if you are located in Thailand and you possess your personal data of a data subject in Thailand, you will be required to comply with the and for those who are located outside of Thailand, there is a possibility that the foreigners will be required to comply with the law as well. But in certain circumstances, for example, if you um, offer goods or service to the data subject in Thailand, you will be required to comply with the PDA requirements. And another one is if you uh, monitor behaviors of the data subject in Thailand, you also uh, require to comply with the law as well. I think it's similar to the GDPR requirements. And for the exemption, we just give it to Okay. Um, according to the PDPA, there are certain exemptions to the PDPA, which are when you present personal data for personal or household activities, when you use it for the media purpose, art, or literature, provided that you comply with the uh, professional ethics or the processing is for the public interest, or uh, when you are the government agencies, such as um, uh, anti money laundering, royal Thai police, or cyber security for the court proceeding or for the proceeding undertaken by the trade, national credit bureau or the legislative body. This the next is the key definitions under the law. Uh, data subjects is an individual who process is personal data. The data controller is can be individuals or juridics persons uh, who has authority to decide the collection use and disclosure of personal data. And for the data processor is the opposite um, of the data controller. They just only follow the instructions and act on behalf of the data controller. Okay, next slide. I try to summarize the key requirements under the law in like, a diagram. This is to facilitate your understandings, but in brief, um, I divide into three sections. The collections, use, retains, and disclosure and transfer. For the first sections, the first one, when you collect personal data, there are certain key requirements, uh, key requirements under the law that you need to be aware of. First, you need to identify the lawful basis. You need to uh, comply with the notification requirements. So in, in Thai, in Thai PDPA is uh, mentioned in section 23. So certain information must be informed to the data subject before or at the time of the collection of the personal data. The third one is to um, collections of the personal data of the miners. So in certain operations of the of the business, there may be the case that you will be uh, you will collect the personal data of the miners. And this is one of the key requirements under the Thai PDP as well that you need to um, aware of. Uh, I divide the, the first section I divide into two sub um, sections. So you collect the personal data directly, and you collect the personal data from other source. So in nowadays, uh, when you 
when you do the business is uh, you, you may contact uh, the data subject, not just only the face-to-face, -face, right? You collect your personal data via an online platform, for example, via website or mobile applications. So you need to um, set out the mechanism or the process, uh, especially for the notifications management and consent management, to ensure that you will comply with the, the notification and consent requirement of the law. And a move to collection of the personal data from other source. Uh, it's, uh, the key requirement is the same, the same set as you collect directly from the data subject. But there are one thing that you need to um, aware. If you collect personal data from other source and you rely, you need to rely on consent as a lawful basis. So you need to inform them firstly about the uh, informations about the processing of the personal data and then obtain the consent from that data subject. And for the internal management for the part two, section two, is all about the internal processing of personal data. And I would like to focus solely on the security measures which will be um, described in one term. Please. Thank you. Okay. For the security measures, even though the PDPA has not yet come into the Ministry of Digital Economy and Society has issued a notification since 2020 to set forth the requirements for the data controller to implement certain security measures in order to protect the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of personal data. For example, the, uh, the notification of the Ministry requires that you must set forth uh, user responsibility to prevent unauthorized access or unauthorized use of the personal data. You must inform your employees or any other personnel that are related to the processing activities of the index notification, as well as build their awareness so they know what they need to do to protect personal data. Then you need to um, designate a user access control to ensure that only those who have authorization can have access to personal data. You need to implement monitoring system to ensure that you can track back how the personal data has been accessed, used, altered, erased in the past. And the index notification uh, allows you to use different security measures providing that such security measures must not be less strict, uh, sorry, less written that the requirements are uh, required under the MS notification. Actually, this MS notification requirement is quite um, similar to those required under international standards, such as the ISO 27001. So if your organization has already complied with such standards, then it should be fine. However, it is also important to be noted that according to the PDPA, uh, after the PDPA comes into the Personal Data Protection Commission might issue another subordinate regulation to require that you implement different security standards than those required under the investment definition. So you have to like, uh, closely monitor the development of the laws. We are running out of time, so I will go fast. Sorry. So, apart from the security measures, you have to comply with monitoring systems for erasure of personal data preventions of unauthorized access, just congested, data breach management, data subject right management, and also as breach of the DPO. And when you disclose or transfer personal data, you also have to think of the DPA. You have to, if you contact with the data processors, the law requires you to have like an agreement between the data controller and data processor with the store or data processing agreement. Or the DPA, and when you transfer the, uh, the personal data to oversee, you need to comply with the cross border transfer requirements as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much, uh, good Mubarak, and good government. If you have questions, on their excellent presentation, please put them on the pigeonhole and we'll come up later. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Ria, who is here and here. 
and she has a very long CV. And maybe I will We've give the highlights. I give the highlights. Okay, 15 years of professional experience, seven in internationally. Uh, organizations such as Nordic Innovation, EY, Norway, Qatar, and the Middle East and North Africa. Guest lecturer at BI Norwegian Business School and Christiana University College. IAPB certificate. This is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So that's a great uh, thing, a real expert. So let's hear about the GDPR four years of experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Special thanks to the Chamber and Seven Peaks for hosting this and to my fellow presenters here today. I am super excited to be here talking about the GDPR. That's what's supposed to be a gift where a guy is nothing to the other. Because that's how people feel when they speak to me about uh, privacy and data protection. I guess we can't all share the same enthusiasm about this, but I am super enthusiastic about uh, this. Not the law per se, but the grander concept uh, behind like, the great principles of the GDPR. This, I'm not going to bore you with speaking about the whole history of uh, the GDPR, but the intention of showing you this slide is to show you that the region of Europe has a very long tradition and robust tradition in terms of human rights, privacy, and data protection, dating back to 1948, as we see, and of course, with the major highlight here, the GDPR in 2018. If you were to read only one thing in the GDPR, that would be Article 5, which outlines the core principles of the GDPR, talking about the lawfulness, the transparency. One thing that I really want to point out to the SMEs here is the data minimization. People speak about data like the new oil and uh, that it's so valuable, but sometimes data can be toxic, meaning that if you are storing much more data than you can, if you have a data breach, you have a huge liability, and the fines will be much, much larger. So if you're interested in GDPR, read Article 5. It's actually pretty good. The risks of not complying. Uh, people speak about hefty fines. I'm not uh, too fond about uh, scaring people with fines and such, but it is, uh, of course, a key thing to think about. Reputational damage can, for some businesses, be much worse if you are on the front cover of a newspaper with your huge data breach, uh, that you're not respecting the privacy of the people that you sell things to and your business relations. That's not where you want to find yourself in 2022. And, of course, you might lose sales. I talk to businesses all the time where they are actually losing business because they can't uh, talk to the clients about how they adhere to privacy and data protection rules, such as the GDPR. And the challenges, of course, for the SMEs in particular. We don't have time for this. Oh my gosh, we have a thousand things to do. And for once of us running one-person companies with all the hats, how can we find time to do compliance on top of that? We don't have money to invest in this important work. We don't have any internal resources. We don't have our own legal teams or our own resources that can help us understand the law, let alone implement it. And of course, who cares? It's so boring, right? <laughs> I see some of you think it's boring, but it isn't, I promise you. Talk about compliance for the small businesses. What are the key tips from, especially in my four years of working with the GDPR, with uh, now numbering 100 plus companies that I work with directly, most of them are small businesses. Don't aim for 100% compliance. And I know that some of the law people here probably would disagree, but I can promise you one thing. And in my view, not even the data protection authorities themselves are 100% compliant all of the time. So please sleep better at night thinking that you don't have to actually aim for that uh, high threshold. The GDPR can be made a bit simpler. Uh, here is a guide intending to make it simple with only 174 pages. Which brings with this, you have to understand the basics of the law. That goes for the GDPR, that goes for the PDPA, the CCPA, somebody mentioned acronyms. I have a lot for you. But 
focus on the basics of the law. Don't try to read the entire legal text and try to do all the things all at once. But one tip here, only rely on credible sources, please. No Facebook groups and no random blog posts from people who aren't in this uh, industry themselves. Tip number three is to investigate your business. And this is, please, as a business club, is the one thing I want you to take away from today is to go back home and look for rather to the offices and look at the systems you are using, on the personal data that you're processing. What are you using? You have cloud storage. What are you using for your newsletters, your member invitation list, your events, accounting, all of that. Where are you hosting all of this personal data? Get that all of you in place, and you are off to a very good start. Uh, GDPR, GDPA, or whatever law we are talking about. Number four, uh, less is not more when it comes to the GDPR or uh, other similar laws. Uh, or if you run uh, agile software projects, I know that we shouldn't be focusing on too much reporting, meeting, and documentation. But when you work with privacy and data protection, start a journal, a simple diary with dates and simple tasks, just so that you are prepared in case you get audited by the regulators and the authorities. Because even though you might not be 100% compliant or even 50, you can show them that we are actually working with this. We have a focus on this in our organization and business, and that will count for a lot for most of the authorities that I know of. And of course, again, simple reminder that uh, do one thing at a time. Uh, don't try to do everything at once. Compliance is a journey. And I hate to break it to you, but compliance is going to be uh, something you need to do going forward in line with accounting, taxes, and all of that other boring stuff that I actually also think is boring. Sorry to the comments here. So uh, with that, I think uh, I am uh, actually ahead of time. Uh, so we spared in some time from uh, from the prior speakers. So this is just to end saying that I hereby consent to you for you sharing my personal data in case you need a GDPR consultant. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. So if you remember those seven tips, you have nothing to worry about. You can sleep well at night. Our next speaker is uh, Vice President of Data Privacy at DTEC for country. Are you in country? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, Bob. What well, an honor. It's an honor to be here. And time is running. Oh. Okay. Well, let me start. June 1st, 2022. How would life be like on that day? Nothing. Everything's the same. You wake up in the morning, everything's still the same. The COVID's still with us. Everything is going to be hot and rainy. Nothing changes. But one thing you could notice is that the data subjects could be coming to your door. Not the authority. The authority, NDES, they got seven people who are working on this law. They're not coming out and check on you. But they would, what they would do is that the, they would announce that the enactment is on that day. So which means that the data subjects, if you are not the customer front of a business, People who will be coming to your door could be your own staffs, your vendors, anybody. If they feel, you know, that the um, information is being used outside of necessity, outside of what you have informed them, they might be coming to you. They have the right to ask how you have processed their information for the past month, two, three, whatever. Who have you shared the information to? They can ask. You, either you're a big company or you're a small businesses, do you know, do you have the visibility, do you have the visibility of all the processing within your company or not? That's the first key. Now, 
if the data subject comes to yourself that you're not able to answer within the specified period of time that the law governs, then they could turn around and report to PDPC or DPA, whoever you want to call them. Thailand, we work on the accusational base, which means that when people file a complaint, they'll come to you. What would they want to see? They want to see the evidence of legal basis assessment. Are you processing the personal information as per the contractual basis? Or if you doing anything outside, do you have a consent? That's the key, right? When you collect, when you use, or all kind of processing, are you basing everything with necessity and proportionality? That's another thing. Third, security, of course, right? Privacy and security, it's just like, peace and carrots. I was gonna say, but don't go, but anyway. <laughs> um, peace and carrots, you know, um, <laughs> it goes together, right? But are they separate? They are separate, they are different. I'll explain that on the next slide. And then when I'm saying the processing inventory or, you know, according to the PDPA, it goes with the ROPA or the record of processing activities. Do you have that? Do you have the visibility of all the use of personal information within your organization or not? Right? On the right side, if you're not able to answer, you don't have the information, then that would trigger what? Legal penalty, of course. First thing you will be hit with administrative fine, right, if you fail. Second thing could be reputational downside or disadvantage or even losing trust, right? Now, here's the key that I want to show. What's data protection? It's like Rob just said, it's not all privacy, no. It's a combination of privacy and security, operational governance controls within the company. Privacy and security would not work, right? Some of the SME, they don't have security. They don't have the systems. They just have laptops. How are you controlling that? The operational controls, segregation of duties, reconciliation. Those kind of things you can't forget. Those are important too. Now coming back to this, data protection is a combination of data privacy. Privacy is all about transparency and the use of personal data. You tell the customers, you tell the data subjects, you tell your employees, you tell whatever. That's a contract, right? If they decide to enter the contract with you, we both win, right? Employees, they accept the terms and conditions of the contract, they work for you. You get them as the employee, as a contract. The information that's generated from the main service, that's all you are allowed to use. If anything outside, you may need a consent, right? So that's the key. Lawful use is about how are you maintaining the purpose limitation. You get the, you collect the personal information for the basis of contract, right? How are you maintaining that the whole time? Of course, you should bring in operational controls, technical controls, so everything is in your disability, right? The second side, security. Security does not go about legal basis. They don't care the accessory, they don't care anything. Security cares for safeguarding. How am I might be identifying the information? You put information in encryption. That doesn't mean you're satisfying with the privacy. But if the objective is for the contractual basis, but you use it for marketing activities, even though you encrypt it, you still wrong with privacy. So going back to the basic privacy and security goes together. But privacy use security as a key to maintain the purpose limitation. All right, so that's the, um, that's the key. Oh, um, on the top thing, I was saying that the, the data protection law governs on privacy, and then we have the cyber security law governs on security, of course. Um, so that's the key. The cyber security law governs on large business who are uh, the critical um, infrastructure uh, information, that's what they hold. But in, in your small business, of course, you, are, you can make a reference to the, um, the announcement by the Digital Economy Ministry uh, back in 2553. They tell you the minimum security you should have, even though you're SME. Okay. 
of symbol in this aspect. Perhaps the last goal about the um, transparency, of course, that's translated into contract consent, lawful use, whatever you tell them, you use it accordingly. And the third thing is that the full responsibility means that the, um, the responsibility does not lie with a single individual, but everyone in the organization, small or big company, of course, is in it. Keynote, we had a month ago. No, two. Right. For two months, what are we doing now? We don't have time. You don't have to spend money. Fix the basic first without paying. Right. At least go back to your own um, business. Start thinking about what is your legal basis for your company. All the user personal information within your company, all the contract, all the user personal information, are they according to the legal basis or not? If they are not, you might be thinking about stop or start collecting consent. If you can make reference to the um, section and size, that's a good thing to study too. You know, everything you have collected prior, you still can use it, you have to inform the data subjects and then give them the right to withdraw, right? But anyhow, so that's a proper lawful basis. And then the, if, like I said that already, if there's, if there's a second objective, you might be thinking about the um, getting consent. And it's data subject request. Have you announced? Have you declared? Whether if they have it, one second. Um, you know, clear wording. Are you ready to accommodate that? I said that earlier. Do you have any visibility uh, on how your personal information is being processed within the company? So that should have the, um, the effect on the data subject rights when you want to accommodate what they are requesting for. Privacy by design, very quickly. You go with the legal basis, assessment for data use, personal information onto necessity and proportionality. You don't use anything outside of necessity. Of course, operational and technical security control design. End to end, right? Well, the last thing I want to say is the process can be enjoyed. It's very important to get that book allows you to have the visibility about processing within the company. And that should end my presentation. Thank you, Para. Well, thank you very much for your treat. That last slide was a very, very practical way to do things, and uh, I think it's extremely useful. So thank you very much. We're going to have a two-minute break now while we set up this, so please replenish your beverages, your snacks, um, etc. I think the biological facilities are out there if you need them, and we'll come back in two minutes. Okay, uh, here we are back again with 30 minutes to piece of time. So, uh, everybody has met all of our panelists, so I don't need to reintroduce. So today, what we're going to do is look at um, uh, a few preliminary points and then get into the questions. So I'll just borrow the slide of answer. Okay, so very briefly, and I'm just going to run through some concepts here which just fill a couple of gaps. So if we look at the Personal Data Protection Act as enacted in 2019, it sets up a Personal Data Protection Committee down here. I don't know if it's got a... Uh, anyway, um, that's in the base in the bottom. The two other main bodies are the... and that was formed early this year. There was an office of the PDPC, which is referred to as the office, on the right-hand side, and then there was a commission. Now, in terms of English translations, we all have always have problems with translating a word into committee or commission. It's not meant to be confusing, but there is uh, a term of art, there's a bit of a difference. So we might call the top left-hand thing the PDPC supervision committee. Anyway, the point is there's sort of three main bodies, and it's a little bit complicated, but this is very difficult. This is the governance. Last year, we had public consultations at concept level on three groups of topics. The first one, you can see a lot of it was about consent, um, rules and procedures on privacy notices, uh, sensitive data, which is about records, about um, gender, about medical records, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, trans transborder mechanisms. Secondly, uh, the second group was about 
representatives um, about uh, consistency, data subjects, rights, and the data processor. Group three, later last year, September, was about codes of conduct, um, automated processing, impact assessments, etc. International cooperation. So what happened to all these? All the feedback from this was put into um, into uh, draft regulations. Uh, this is what was presented last September. Once the PPC has been established, the full report, including feedback on the three projects, draft subject relations, master plan, and draft guidelines, would be presented, and then there would come to be um, a, a full set of the draft regulations. So here. Uh, in 49, 28, and 20 pages are the draft regulations that you can, obviously we're not going to look at them now, but they're there. Unfortunately, what is the status? The uh, concept level public hearings were very useful, extremely good, um, but after the PDPC formation, the draft regulations would have been published at the end of the last year, but the PDPC was not formed until early this year. They've been, let me say, quietly uploaded to the MDS website. There's little or no explanation of the logic of the contents. However, we can analyze them and see some precedent evident there. During the concept level hearings, parts of the draft regulations were used to illustrate concepts. Unfortunately, at this moment, with a very short time to go before we get into operational mode 1 June, there has been no organized public hearing yet or request for comment on the draft regulations. We sincerely hope there will be, because it's going to be difficult for everybody to understand these before we get into it. So, what to do? And that's been the discussion about today. What to do? We've heard some excellent advice. We must not sit still. We have things to do. We have to take responsibility to get ready. The primary law is unlikely to change. So the devil is certainly in the detail of the regulations, but without knowing exactly what those regulations are, we still need to do the best we can to get ready. And you've had outstanding advice today in how to approach this, and we're going to discuss that a little bit further. Um, there may be a deferral, as the speakers have mentioned. It's not confirmed. There may be a deferral of for small companies, not SMEs as defined, but small companies, mini companies that uh, don't have a lot of data interaction. Exactly what that means, we don't really know yet. There may possibly be a delay for that, and I am told there may be plans not to levy heavy fines for a while, just to let people get settled in. Okay, so let's go on to our use cases, and we're going to approach these questions through use cases. So the first one is about email lists. And we have email lists all the time. And we love to use them because we can use them for marketing purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, what about these email lists? What do I need to do to respect the rights of the data subjects? And what essentially are those rights? Let me ask in a PDPA context, and all these questions should be very brief, okay? But let me ask who will right first. Essentially, I have these email lists. What am I going to do? Okay, so I think first you need to identify whether or not such list of email is considered as personal email. Because some email cannot identify a person, right? So it is not considered personal email and you don't need to comply with your PDPA. But if considered as personal data, then you need to comply with your PDPA requirements. Um, to comply with the data subject right request, you need to listen and respond to that request, which means that under the law, they, are, have, they have certain rights, and you need to um, respond to that request when they come to you and ask, for, um, ask to exercise their rights. So you need to set out like a data subject right management in your organizations. Maybe you need to have a data subject right request forms. This is like a formality which is not required by law, but you may need to have it like for the evidence to be reported. And because sometimes the authority may come to investigate and ask for that the piece of document. So 
this is to um, ensure that you comply with the NEPA subject by request. Okay, thank you very much. From four years of experience with the GDPR, Rita, would you add anything to that? Uh, yes, I think one key point is what is personal data. So you really need to understand what is personal data. And as Paul said, like, is it a business email? Is it personal data? And here is a tricky thing, especially in the GDPR, that even though an email address is used for business purposes, in the GDPR, as long as you can identify an individual, it is indeed personal data. So that is a huge uh, thing to be aware of because if I have an email address with my initials and I am the only person in the company, then my email address is indeed personal data. And then also it relates to the purpose. As Montre said earlier, like you have to look at the purposes and you have a legal basis for processing the emails on the email list. Did you get it uh, through a contractual agreement? Or did you buy lists from somewhere? Are you absolutely sure that those people obtained consent in the first place? So go back to your lists, emails, or whatever, and look at, do you have a legal basis? And what is the purpose of using this uh, personal data? OK, thank you very much. And the same thing in the PDPA is, of course, that it is data from which a person, individual, can be identified. So let's move on to some of the pigeonhole questions, and we have our a pigeonhole operator here, but uh, I'm going to, I've got them here as well, so I'm going to pick up some of the pigeonhole questions. Uh, the first one is, I organized an event. I want to share the data for marketing purposes, with sponsors, etc. Can I do that? Why shouldn't I? I've got all your email information here. You've come to this event. Thank you very much. Why can't I just share that with my sponsors and make money out of it? Kumontri, what do you think? The question is still about the email list, right? It's about all the people who attended here. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not doing yet. Well, <laughs> added to not Prat and added to <laughs> personal data, first of all, is that the um, PDPA or GDPR. Um, I can say that PDPA is actually, is actually the copy and page from GDPR. You can say that. All right. So the definition of personal data it goes about the information that could direct to people directly or indirectly, right, to the individual without knowing name, right? That could be considered as personal data. I'll give you one example. If I could tell that the um, green and red rose to a person who is 220 centimeters tall in the Piatai area, can you do that? I say possibly, because you don't have, you don't even have to know a name, but that um, and I mean, <laughs> 220 centimeters tall is not a lot. Probably just one person in that area. Can you still do the offer? Yes, right. It doesn't have to be a red rose. An offer, um, a round trip ticket to Hong Kong to that person. You still can offer without knowing name. So coming back to the email list, I have the email list of the individuals in here, but I know you all are making a lot of money. I could turn around and make some or monetize information here to the marketing company, right? The information turns out to be valuable. So the key is how the law of PDPA or GDPR would come into protection of those, you know, of being out of the end of the uh, the people who could be doing something outside of the contractual basis, and, you know, for us as the control, not us, but rather all as a controller. So, email list to me, I think this the, um, could be deemed as personal data. Going back to the basic, if you are about to use it, why are you using it? Start asking yourself. Reply all should be stopped, right? You want to be sure the people in the list, perhaps you want to do the reply all, the content, the content confidenti um, confidentiality, right? So be sure who you want to reply to, right? Or if you, want, if you really want to reply all, do the YCC. I think that's the best way to protect it. But are they personal data to me? They are. 
So let me just explore very briefly, what should I have done? Is there anything about consent or anything like that? What should I have done if I wanted to share that? If it's a trail of email, the conversation's been going on, right? Um, first of all, if there is anything relating to work-related, if these people or, you know, all the participants in this room, if we all are seven peaks employees, or shapes commerce, or we are part of the, you know, by the business, the content of the email that's directed to them or relating to the, um, the work-related, I think it's just that. Because we are all under the contractual basis to begin with. You're employees, you are business partners, or anything. So the content versus the people who you are directing the email to, that's the main key. So if anything happens, you can turn around and start making points of why you are sending emails to this list of participants here. We have reason to give them that. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's move on to the next use case. Customer supplier lists, okay, and I've got these lists, and uh, I may need to, uh, I may want to disclose them. I've got a question for you, Vin Um Do I need to say, in collecting data, do I need to say anything about what I'm going to use it for? So, for example, if we look at the three stages, there's uh, collection, use, disclosure. Do I need to say anything to people, or do I just get it and use it? Get it and use it for anything I want. How does that work? Okay. Okay, so according to the PDPA, you need to infer the data subjects of certain information on how you will process their personal data, for example. What categories of personal data that you will process, for what purpose, who you will disclose, what are the retention period, and what are their rights, for example. So, uh, in the event that you want to use the customer or supplier's personal data, the answer is that yes, you need to inform them of the purpose and the relevant category of personal data as required in Section 23 of the PDPA. So, this one is generally done by the use of the privacy notice or privacy policy that you may have already seen, uh, that um, many companies have already implemented. Okay. We're having problems with the personal sound. Yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to the next use case and to the member list. So let's think of something we maybe are a member's organization like a chamber of commerce or something like that. And we think of ourselves as part of a community. And we join that community because we trust the organization and we think that that organization is going to look after our data well. Okay, I'm sure this applies equally in the GDPR context as well as GDPR. So let's hear from Korea's experience on member organizations, and I'm going to give you the microphone. Yes, I think one important thing to remember about any kinds of email lists or lists with personal data is that the purpose is connected to the lawful grounds of processing, meaning that you have to define the purpose of processing the personal data in the first place. So let's say that that is to allow uh, uh, Hop to become a member. So that is the purpose, and the legal grounds could be contractual basis, for example. So if you want to use uh, Bob's personal data for other purposes, strictly speaking, in the GDPR, you need a lawful basis for each and every purpose, unless they are very, very tightly linked. So you need to look at those, that specific use case. Uh, if we go back to the email list, I would say that uh, you should, uh, before the GDPR, a lot of companies, they were just sharing all of the participant lists and the event lists with their, either the highest bidder or their collaboration partners. But that pretty much stopped with the GDPR. And this is also related to marketing groups. So you have to be aware of the marketing laws in addition. And in the GDPR now, you, you have to, if you want someone for an event, you would usually see like several tick boxes asking for explicit consent to share your personal data with uh, partner one, two, and three, for example. 
Uh, others, they try to tie it into the terms of conditions. So they base it on a contract where they say that if you decide to attend our event, then you also uh, allow us to share your personal data. And this is a huge uh, minefield in the privacy and data protection field. So uh, what I would ensure, and my best advice in this respect, is to, again, know what you have, ensure that you have a purpose and a lawful basis for the processing, and make sure that you are transparent. You can take down a lot of requests and red flags uh, with people if you are just honest about how you use the personal data. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, key message from that is that you've got to be clear about the purpose for which you are collecting the data. And I'll just ask the corollary question. What, how long do I keep it? Do I keep it forever, or is there some principle about only collecting it for my very useful business purpose and then I have to destroy it after that? <laughs> is this something you would like to consider? About the time, how long do you think you can keep the data for? Okay, so according to the PDPA, there is no specific requirement. Uh, no specific timeline of which you can retain the personal data. However, the principle that underlying the PDPA said that you have to uh, collect personal data to the extent of necessity and relevancy to the purposes of which you will present the personal data. So if you do not have a lawful purpose, then you should not retain it. Further, the obligation of the data controller that imposed by the PDPA is that you must uh, implement a monitoring system to ensure that personal data that is no longer relevant or no longer required must be deleted or erased after the retention period or when the data subject withdraw consent or whenever the PDPA prescribed. So you cannot retain personal data like indefinitely like most of the companies that we represent do. You need to set a specific timeline by considering that um, what are the lawful purpose and what are the needs to retain that data. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next news case, which was the event participation data. We probably we probably cover a lot of this, but let me add a twist to this tale. It turns out that we we're pretty sophisticated marketing people, and we need to get some help in analysing this data. We've got thousands of people at our event. And we don't have in-house all the tools to do that. So I have a service provider, and I need to send this data to the service provider. They're based in the cloud, but I don't know really what country they're in. So what do I do? Now, I'm going to ask Kunwira about this initially, and then we're going to come back to Kunwira, who's going to tell us about Section 28. So Kunwira first. You're opening up a real beast file there, Bob. <laughs> I don't know how many issues we have uh, with that uh, scenario. But um, so, first of all, you have to look at the purpose again. And then you have to define the lawful basis of processing depending on the purposes for which you are processing the personal data. And uh, there might be nothing wrong with sharing that data with uh, an analytics company. But uh, I guess you mentioned the, the using it in the cloud um, because of a, so you have something called assurance to ruling, which pretty much makes any transfer of personal data to a third country, which could be the US, for example, uh, very, very complex and difficult uh, these days. And again, I just want to go back to the basics, like know what personal data you are processing, know the purpose, know the lawful basis, get the records of processing activities up, and uh, try to get that overview, first and foremost. And then I would suggest you start looking at, like, who are we sharing the personal data with? Do we need to stop sharing it? Like uh, what you was mentioning here earlier. And uh, then, yeah, just have the basics in order, because if you start worrying about all the data transfers before you even know the basics of the PDPA or the GDPR, you're going to be overwhelmed. So uh, I think overview is a key word here to know what you hold and you know what you're processing. Okay, to add on, I would like to um, say in the perspective of using cloud service. So some of the company use technologies to retain personal data, right? And some company have a question about that as well, whether or not sending data to cloud sender 
consider cost budget transfer or not. So we have to consider whether uh, such such a transfer consider cost order. So you need to um, analyze uh, in relation to the sending of personal data. So first, you have to um, ensure whether any person outside of Thailand can access to data that retain in the online storage, for example, the cloud systems. If the answer is yes, the cross-border transfer requirement will be triggered. And as the data controller who based in Thailand, you will be uh, required to comply with the cross-border requirements under Section 28. And apart from um, Section 28, if that person who located outside of Thailand is your affiliate company or your group company, you can um, use the exemptions under other section as well by relying on VCR, by like corporate rules or in terms of transfer agreements. This is one of the exemptions for transferring to the affiliates of the group companies. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to the next use case. Um, employee records. We're just going to spend one minute on this because there's obviously going to be certain sensitive data, section 26, involved in employee records. So let me just ask, without covering the whole thing, what would be two things that you would be most concerned about in terms of employee records and special protection? I'm going to ask each of you just very, very briefly. Remember, right? quick question, quick response. Okay. Explicit okay. Uh, consent will be required under section 26, right? So you will have to identify first whether or not the employee personal data is considered sensitive personal data. Under the PDPA, there is no definition for sensitive personal data, but the, the law provides the example of the sensitive personal data under section 26. So mostly it is re, uh, it's related to health data, biometric data, because some, some commonly used by a as uh, fingerprint for, uh, to access the door, or maybe the, um, what I say? Ah, yes, Iris, yes. And yes, biometric data, health data, or maybe sometimes criminal report. This kind of sensitive person that will be required the, the data controller to obtain explicit consent. Explicit consent, okay, very good. Quick, quick responses <laughs> to this question. Quick. Yes, know what sensitive data you might be processing. Second, delete what you no longer have on it for lawful grounds for processing. Very good point. Delete what you don't have to be have lawful grounds. Good entry, very quick. Yeah, well, contractual basis, of course, and then the identifying necessity, legal basis, um, prior to the information you're collecting. And then if it's anything outside of the employment, contractual basis, you may need an explicit consent prior. Okay. Could that run? Quick response? Um, apart from um, what the three speaker has just, have said just now, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the social security, sorry, the labor protection law, which requires that you must maintain the information of employees. So as long as you maintain the information that required that act, you can rely on the legal obligation. Okay. Very good. Now, um, before we get on to that, I'm going to just ask two questions very briefly from the, the pigeonhole. PDPA is also related to and complied with, as the question reads, with protection of my banking and financial data, passwords, balance, credit card, and secret codes. How does the PDPA govern this, if at all? Good wondering. Quick answer? Well, PDPA does not govern now but we have make reference to the industry standard. Okay. It could be PCI DSS, ISO 27001, ITOM, it could be anything, but PDPA itself does not govern on how, but we have to assess, you should have adequate or solid protection. Protection, okay. There's a couple of questions here, uh, the difference between the data controller and data processor, I think this was well covered by the two being given slide, so we don't need to address it again. The data controller is the primary person the data processor works under the direction of the data controller. There are very interesting issues about liability of each. We won't go into that right now. Practical question. CRM programs, customer relationship management programs, and line business app. How do these reflect, how do these sit with the PDPA 
how about Google shared files? Normal practices are really just to share these things without worrying too much. What should we be worried about? Um, the number right, quick response. I think it costs a lot of time for requirement again. So because um, the Google shared drive can access probably other persons that look at, like living outside Thailand. So the issue of the cost for the transfer requirement must be um, considered. Okay, so that brings in, could Montreal, could this all? Korea, do you want to make? Yeah, I just want to make a, a quick comment there. It goes back again to you have to know what you have and you have to make sure that you protect the personal data because the law isn't called uh, the privacy law, it's called the general data protection regulation. So you have to protect the data, you can't allow access, for example, for all your employees to all the personal data within your company, most likely. So in the CRM system, in the uh, account, the Google accounts, for example, make sure that you know that, at least from a GDPR perspective, you can't allow access to just whomever, or share it with whomever. So okay. that's also important. All right. I am now going to turn to a not so favorite topic, a privacy policy. In the last few weeks, I've done a survey of major well-known brands around Thailand. I'm not going to mention them. And what I've seen is a massive, fully compliant GDPR policy used by some. No mention of the PDPA. Others have used entirely PDPA, many, many, many pages with no reference to GDPR. Others have used, tried to do a mix of them. And others did a one pager with three lines on it. So this is a extraordinary range of responses. What, what we are going to try and do in this business community going forward is we're going to try to come up with some standards and suggestions about how to approach your, your privacy policy. There may not be any such thing as a model policy that you can just grab and stick on your website. There may not be. But let's try to help people to get to a privacy policy. I want to go back and just wrap this up. I want everybody to just mention one final piece of advice. 20 seconds, one final piece of advice, starting with you, Bill Dockara. I think first you need to um, identify which sector you are, you in, sorry. So if you have financial sectors, in the financial sectors, or telecommunication business operators, that is a specific regulation that you need to um, take into consideration as well, apart from the PDPA, because, for example, the OIC, each one company, they have like a guideline for um, processing of the personal data, which including the data privacy, uh, okay. privacy services. Different so, sectors have different guidelines. Know who you are. Yes. Very good point. Go. Breathe. <laughs> don't panic and don't aim for 100% compliance. Finish the first task that you start working on and don't keep coming back to the PDPA and GDPR over and over again because you're going to waste a lot of time. So stay focused in your work uh, ahead and the best of luck to all of you. I like that. Good morning. Right, well, um, three simple words that the uh, transparency, of course, um, be, trans be transparent about what you should do. Uh, it can be communicated through privacy policy obligation contract or even a consent to be sure that each one of them has the objective or the incorrect contextual objective clearly and separately. Second thing is the lawful use of data that you have. Use it as per the context that you have informed the customers. And the third thing that the we, if, you know, uh, small business, um, SMB or a large corporate, we should have the visibility of the processing of the personal information within um, your company. that it should be brief when possible. However, you should still ensure that you have the privacy policy has contained all information that required by under the PDPA. Otherwise, you will be at risk of breaching the PDPA and an instructive fine will be imposed on you. Okay, so thank you very much. I just want to mention, in wrapping up, we are in an imperfect situation. We do not have the finalized regulations. And trust me, all the detail about how this actually operates is there. But the primary law is not going to change. We need to take responsibility to get ready. We've heard today on how to do this, but we on our side will try to talk to the government to get a proper public hearing on the final regulations and get those in place. And now we've come to the time where we ask the Vice President of the Norwegian Chamber to say a few words about pizza, I think. <laughs> I 
think I've already spoken about the pizza, but uh, the pizza is uh, here, thank you to the tiny widget chamber of commerce. So a big applause for us. <laughs> there are two other sponsors for this, uh, this evening, and uh, I'd like you stay to come up here for a second. So Yostan is one of the owners of Seven, uh, Seven Peaks, and I think you should say a little bit about your company. You are sponsor of the space, of the beer, and he's always very, very supportive to the chamber. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for my first. Um, first of all, thank you for all the, the speakers. Um, also, as a representative of, um, of the Tribe Chamber, um, I'm very happy to see all of you here. Um, as well as the 70s. Uh, so 70s here are a national software and design agency. We've been here the last what, eight years, uh, primarily working uh, with tight clients, primarily enterprise, um, as well as quite a lot of projects with Scandinavia. So of course, GDPR, GDPA is a uh, necessary evil, something we need to, uh, to know about. And, uh, and we just actually started kicking off our own engagement now and related to this. Um, because again, it's, it's a very important part now moving forward for every engagement project. So enjoy, yeah, have some pizza, some beer, um, meet some new friends, go like change emails. Um, <laughs> and <it's not> <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. And for those of you who are not drinking beer, we also do have some wine here today. So if I can ask Matteo from Texaco to come and say a few words. Thank you, thank you Vivekas so much, and thank you for seven weeks for having us here tonight. Uh, we are uh, an Italian uh, uh, importers in Thailand, in Thailand for over 10 years right now. So we set up a corner over there, where we today you can uh, enjoy three different kind of uh, Italian wines, and of course if you like it, you'll be able to purchase it and we will deliver to your door. So, <laughs> thank you so much uh, again for inviting us here tonight, and uh, Please come to see us in our corner. We'll be happy to share some more with you. Thank you. And before we're giving a small gift to the to the speakers, uh, we do a little bit of branding for them too. We have Tilligan Gibbons here, who is one of our members. And Tilligan Gibbon is, of course, one of the best law firms in town. So if you have any issues on PDPA, these are the ones that you need to go to. Then we have DTAC. Now, of course, the best telecom provider in the <laughs> best telecom provider in Bangkok, and I'm sure that they are really keeping our privacy. Right, Andre? Thank you. And Ria, she is new in town. Now she is sniffing on doing some business here. So I'm just telling to those other chambers that are here. I'm sorry, she's already taken. She's our member. But having said that, you can be a member of more than one chamber. So start working on her. <laughs> and Bob, thank you. I know that he was supposed to be in Singapore, but uh, extended his uh, stay here in Thailand for a few days so he could be here today. Uh, he's always extremely supportive of uh, our events. He is uh, very knowledgeable in the area. And if you want to learn more from Bob, that means number one, you have to be a member of a chamber. If you're a member of a chamber, then you are a member of Joint Foreign Chamber of Commerce, and you're welcome to join the Digital Economy and ICT Committee. So that was a little bit of branding here. Now we have some small giveaways. By the way, the book that we have here, some of you have seen it, but this is uh, Shula Lundgren's Travel Through Norway. And it's a really good uh, visual to see his travel then and how Norway is now. May I invite Kun Nokarat and Kun Gabriel together? <laughs> We're very high. 
hungry. We want the pizza. <laughs> So before we're feeding everybody, can we have joint for one group photo up here? We will do it with masks. We have to be careful, but we do allow you to eat without the masks. <laughs> so please, can everybody join for a group photo? <laughs> 